Uh, doors are closed. I think we can start. Uh, can everybody hear me? If I'm, I'm not sure how loud this actually is. It sounds loud. Very good. Cool. Uh, thanks everyone for coming in on a Sunday morning. Um, that's really cool. Really appreciate it. Good to see a bunch of friends in here. Uh, and everyone else, obviously, too. Um, if I sound a little funny, this might be a German accent or the uh, karaoke party last night, which was a lot of fun. I hope you all made it there. Uh, I'm going to talk today um, about DFIR and IDS for Wi-Fi networks. So DFIR, Digital Forensics and Incident Response, and IDS, Intrusion Detection. Um, this is the first time I'm talking about a Wi-Fi topic. Um, I spent a lot of time um, working on this, and I spent a lot of time in the whole Wi-Fi space in this summer. Um, and um, I think it's the spirit of this conference, too, that I would love to get your feedback, not only on the talk itself, but also on everything that you're seeing, because I think we're all coming here to discuss things. So because I'm showing this for the first time to such a broad audience, and I'm also releasing an open source tool today, um, I would love to get your very honest feedback after this, because as I said, I'm also still kind of new to the Wi-Fi space, so you might have a lot of input. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm leaving a lot of space for uh, Q&A today. And um, yeah, I hope we'll have a discussion either during the talk. I'll be around until tomorrow afternoon. I hear there's some kind of beer fest today in town, so I guess there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to, to talk for the rest of the day. A uh, few things about me. My name is Leonard Koopman, uh, 29 years old. I was, before I kind of stumbled into the uh, security space, I was a software architect and software developer. Um, I started the Greylock open source project in 2009. I don't know if anyone... Sorry if anyone about any one of you heard about that before. Um, it's uh, it's a log management tool, open source, um, specifically or very much focused on security and very much built for logs. So uh, I guess you all would like that. This talk today, however, is not about Greylock. I'll use it because I'm obviously very familiar with the tool, um, and because this other open source thing that I'm releasing today is actually writing into Greylock. But you could use any other log management tool um, for this probably too. So. Um, I don't want to make this an awkward vendor talk or something. Um, I was born and raised in Germany, um, moved to the U.S. in 2015. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, this is where I uh, spend a lot of time over the day. Uh, you can do that. It's at underscore then my first name. Or you can also su subscribe to my blog, which is at wtf.horse, which was the best drunk domain purchase of my life, I think. It's also, it's a premium domain. They charge you like $90 for that. So it was still a good idea, I think. Uh, and you always have to put an HTTPS in front because no one will know that this is an internet address. But not the smartest marketing idea, probably. So I moved from up there on the right in northern Germany where it's very cold and never warm and never really cold, so you only got kind of the autumn vibe all day long, to Houston where it's very wet this summer especially um, and also very humid. So I moved from this place to this place. <laughs> no, it's actually pretty beautiful. I love Houston. You should all come. Um, OK, the uh, agenda for today. I'm, uh, I want to give you a really, really short intro to uh, Wi-Fi security in general, and then uh, spend a little time looking at the 802.11 um, uh, specification and protocol, and specifically what management frames are, um, because that is important um, for the whole, not only IDS, but also the DFIR part for Wi-Fi's. Um, I want to explain a few of the common attacks. So you probably all heard about, for example, rogue access points, uh, evil twin attacks. Um, so I want to want to show you some of those and also explain how you can uh, how you can detect those. So for example, there is a, a very good open source. Um, Wi-Fi intrusion detection tool called Kismet. Um, so if you look at their code, for example, you can actually see how they detect certain stuff. They have pretty good documentation explaining all of this. So I want to go over a few of these things. Then I want to show you my new tool, which I called Enzyme. Um, I had a, uh, a very good discussion last year with people in New York City who run kind of a, a lab co-working space, which is interesting. They're all in biology and DNA and stuff like that. And I, uh, we were talking about what is, is there any similarities between cybersecurity or information security and how the, uh, uh, how the human body works and how the human body uh, uh, reacts if it finds viruses or bacteria, for example. So somehow I ended up with the name Enzyme. Um, 
This is an open source tool. I'm going to talk more about this. Um, and then give you actually a few examples. Um, this is going to be a live demo, so let's hope this actually works. If it doesn't, I have some screenshots prepared because I did live demos before and sometimes they simply don't work. So uh, we have a fallback for that. And then, like I said, um, we have a lot of time for Q&A today because I would anticipate that there's going to be a bunch of questions. Um, I would really love that. So, short introduction to Wi-Fi security. I always knew before I spent more time with this that it's probably kind of insecure to be in a Wi-Fi in general. It is a total mess. The more time you spend with it, it's just you want to put wires in your house everywhere and just don't just rip the card out of your MacBook. Um, it um, attacks are pretty hard to detect and uh, also very hard to mitigate simply because the attacker could be sitting in the parking lot. So it's something that gets directly into your local network, um, but still you can be far away. So this doesn't have to be someone who has a who has a, a network cable with them and just plucks it in the wall somewhere, it could be sitting in the parking lot and attacking your network. Um, and another problem is that Wi-Fi today is extremely popular. Uh, I mean, light bulbs have Wi-Fi today. Um, every phone has Wi-Fi. Every computer has Wi-Fi. My mom uses Wi-Fi and just thinks that's the internet. This is how consumers think about that, right? And that's okay. Um, but the problem is they don't understand the risks and the attack surface of this. So attacking is also very cheap, and I would say it's commoditized by now. Um, Probably a bunch of people walking around here with uh, little uh, uh, Wi-Fi pineapples that make attacking a Wi-Fi so easy if you understand a little bit about it. This is actually how I got into it because everyone had one, so I thought I'm going to buy one and just look at it and got interested in it. Um, it's just so easy and it's so cheap. I mean, you get the, what does a Wi-Fi uh, pineapple nano cost today? Like 100 bucks or something off the internet? You have it two days later. So it's really easy to attack and it's really cheap to attack. Yeah, this is, I mean, they sell them with these little tactical packs and you can, you can just strap them on your belt and walk around with it. Um, this is the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Um, it's basically a complete attack platform that has multiple Wi-Fi chips in it. Comes with a nice little web interface that you can open on your phone, has a management access point, and you can just click around a little and you'll start certain Wi-Fi attacks. Um, that really, that, that one really opened my, uh, opened my eyes. So, the Wi-Fi standard is 802.11. I learned that it's abbreviated as just .11. Um, that helps. Um, and um, there's 17 different versions. So you'll probably see when you buy a, a Wi-Fi adapter online, you'll see that it's an 802.11a, b, g, n. What I learned is, and that's actually different, that's very important, the, uh, the different versions don't actually define big differences in the standard itself. This is mostly about um, different frequencies, bandwidth, modulation, and by that data rates. So one of them, for example, open up the 5 gigahertz um, uh, license-free uh, frequencies. So 802.11 is usually 802.11. It doesn't really matter what, what kind of um, uh, letter is behind it. So that makes it easier already. So we can just talk about 802.11 in general. Um, that protocol is also defining frequencies and channels um, because whoever wrote this figured out pretty early, oh, there's probably got a lot of people are going to use this. So we have to spread this out over multiple channels and multiple frequencies. So for the 2.4 gigahertz band, for example, this is channel 1 to 14, where I think in North America it's really only channel 1 to 11, um, where the most popular channels are 1, 6, and 11 because they don't overlap with any other frequency. So if you have a uh, if you have a corporate network, so our office, for example, is in downtown Houston, um, where there's just a lot of noise. We have these weird antennas on the roof that mess with the network in itself already, um, and um, you can you can see that there's a lot of noise on that frequency band already. So they come up with new and new frequencies uh, to make more room for all the communication. Now that light bulbs and toasters and juice makers uh, need these frequencies, you just need more frequencies, basically. Um, and the MAC layer of the uh, 802.11 standard defines three types of frames. A frame, I'm, I'm not following the terminology of 802.11 here very strictly, simply because they talk about stations and non-stations and all kinds of stuff. I simplify this a little. Um, the standard itself is this thick. Um, it's a lot of stuff in there for a bunch of functionality I've never seen before in any kind of Wi-Fi. Um, but I'm going over the most important here. So there's three types of frames. Um, there's management frames. This is what we'll be focusing on today. There's control frames. Um, this is simply to assist in delivery with data frames, which is your actual data. So in your data frames, your, your emails, your websites, HTTP, TCP, everything is in those. 
However, to be able to join a Wi-Fi network, you have to uh, do a whole dance with a bunch of management frames. This is your, if your, um, if your computer or your phone decides to connect to a Wi-Fi network, then it's sending a bunch of management frames back and forth until it's authenticated and then able to send control and data frames. Control and data frames are interesting if you want to sniff data. Uh, we're not really focusing on that today. We're focusing about the attack surface of management frames. So every type, so every frame type, then um, defines several subtypes. And I learned that the most important thing to understand if you want to learn more about Wi-Fi security is to understand the subtypes of the management frame type. So there is a bunch of them. We're going to go over them um, right now because it, this is really important for the, um, for the IDS and the DFIR part. So the first frame type is called the authentication frame type. I put the abbreviation behind it. That's kind of a standard. It depends on what you look at. Um, if you are, for example, if you're analyzing stuff with uh, Wireshark, it might be a little different. I follow those of um, of uh, TCP dump and the official standard. Uh, so you'll see these abbreviations later in the demo a little more. Um, the authentication frame is what your device sends um, as a first step when it wants to join a wireless network. So you're at Starbucks. You want to join their network, it sends an authentication frame, um, and being authenticated or not restricts the ability to send or to receive in a network. Again, you have to be authenticated to be able to send or receive any, um, any control or data frames. If you're not authenticated, then uh, that stuff's simply going to be discarded. No one's going to look at it because you're not in the association table of the access point. Um, the authentication process itself, and this is already where the standard gets a little a little interesting, I would say. It depends if you're connecting to a, a WEP or, for example, a WPA um, network, simply because it feels like the WPA encryption has kind of been bolted on the original um, uh, 802.11 standard when everyone figured out, oh, God, WEP is not at all secure. Um, so if you see a WEP network somewhere, just do not use it. Um, you can crack those so fast. Um, I hope that's common knowledge by now. But this is different. I don't want to go too deep into that, but there's a different sequence of authentication and secrets and stuff being exchanged before you're authenticated. Then there is this is probably everyone's favorite frame. It's the de-authentication frame. Um, you'll see that a lot either in an attack itself, and we're going to look at that in a second, or you'll see that um, as part of another attack. What this does, it's, it's a simple unidirectional announcement um, from one station to another station, so for example, from the Hyatt access point to my iPhone, saying, hello, I would like to wish, I would like to wish to terminate any secure communication with you. For whatever reason. This is unidirectional. They immediately take you out of the association table. They act like you're not in here anymore, and your phone then has to decide if, um, if that should be followed or not. Usually your phone will do that. Any device will do that. And, um, basically, the access point just tells your phone to go away. I don't want you here anymore. The problem is management frames are completely unencrypted and can be spoofed very, very easily. Um, it's completely unencrypted frames. So if you have a Wi-Fi card that allows you to send any kind of packet, which is any card that supports packet injection, which you get for like 30 bucks off of Amazon Prime. So if you order them now, you'll have them probably by tomorrow morning. Um, um, that means that I could, I could have a Raspberry Pi here that just sends a deauthentication frame, and your phone would follow it if I just pretend that the access point sent it. And that's just a field in the message. It's not encrypted. Everyone can send that. Um, now, when I read this for the first time, I thought, well, who, who put this in the standard? That doesn't sound like a very good idea. But if you, if you think about it, you actually need something like this, because it comes with a reason code. And there is, I think, 70 reason codes um, that are defined in another I think at least 200 that are open for vendors to use. Um, but a reason code could be, for example, your previous authentication is no longer valid. This is what happens when Hyatt decides you get the guest access for six hours, and then some cron jock kicks you out and says, nope, deauthenticated, you have to buy our pass now. Um, a station has to be able to kick you out. The problem is that everything's unencrypted, and this, I think, was simply done to make it easy for consumers to... Um, uh, to connect to networks, because if you had to exchange kind of a... Because remember, the management frames are used to connect to the network at all, so you, there's no authentication yet at this point. So you would have to kind of exchange a pre-shared key and all of that. This would this would never work, especially not with a juice maker, I guess. So um, 
This is simply a fact, and this, this opens a huge attack surface. More about that in a second. Then there's the association request. Um, this is the last step for joining a network. This is basically after you're authenticated, you say, okay, I would like to be associated with this access point now. Because you also have to remember there could be, like here in the Hyatt Wi-Fi, for example, there's probably 100 access points that serve the same network. So your phone decides which, um, which access point to actually connect to. Um, this then allocates resources on the access point, synchronizes both stations. Uh, this is just part of the authentication, basically. It's the association response. This is simply the access point says, yep, you're allowed. I got you in my association table. All good. Um, this also includes information about the supported data rates because many chips today support a lot of different data rates. They could be on, uh, um, they could be on, uh, on, on different data rates and different channels. All of this is done during the association request. So they basically agree on a format uh, of communication when that happens. It's the reassociation request. This is when you walk down the hallway, your phone decides, wait, I'm much closer to this access point now. I should deauthenticate or should disassociate from this one behind me that has a lower signal strength and reassociate to that one. Then these two will talk to each other and be like, no, no, he's authenticated here already, so I'll let him in here. All of this happens. This is a reassociation request. I don't see them very often. I honestly don't know why, but they are there apparently. Same thing with the response. This is um uh, just the same thing where it says like, yep, you're in, you're authenticated, and you are associated with me now. This disassociation, this is when my phone says, nope, I don't want to be uh, associated with you anymore. Um, this is basically like a graceful shutdown. Imagine if you would just walk away without disassociating, then the access point would have to wait for a timeout to actually clear you out of the association table because you might still be there, but they'll wait a few minutes and then be like, nah, he's probably gone. Um, I'll kick you out. So this is just a nice way to do it. The standard says you should do it. Um, but if you just walk away, it obviously doesn't happen. You just poof, go away. This one is interesting. This is the beacon frame. Uh, the beacon frame is by far the most common frame type that's in the air here right now. Um, this is access points um, basically announcing that they are there. They are like a beacon out there and they say, hello, I'm here. This is my supported rates. This is, um, this is the channel I'm operating on. This is my SSID. Um, if you want to connect to me, connect to me. I'm here. Um, this is, if you click on your, uh, on Windows, I think it's on the bottom right, on OS X is on the top right. If you click on your little Wi-Fi icon, it shows you all the networks that are there. Um, it says I'm scanning for networks. It's not actually scanning for anything. It's just waiting for beacon frames on all channels to come in. And um, then it just collects the SSIDs and tells you this is all of the access points that are on range. So it's, it's really like the name. It is a beacon um, of access points that are out there. Then there's the probe request. That one has a lot of very interesting information. So the phones that are in this room here right now, if you have Wi-Fi enabled, they are probably sending tons of probe requests in this moment. This is basically, um, this is your phone asking the whole vicinity around you is a specific access point here, and it will answer with a probe response, which comes in a second. So if you're, for example, you're leaving your office, you're going home, then between that, you're probably, you're in your car, you're in the train, whatever. Between that, your phone is probably not being connected to Wi-Fi. So it constantly tries to figure out, wait a second, maybe I'm close to home, so let me ask if I'm close to home. So it sends out a probe request that says, hello, home network, are you here? And then it listens for a probe response from the home network that says, yes, I am here. Um, that is interesting because it's unencrypted. You can listen to all of that and you can build pretty interesting profiles of the phones that are around you because they'll show you your office network. They, in fact, my phone is sending this for, uh, for our office network in, uh, in Hamburg where all of our engineers work and for my home network in Hamburg and for my home network in Houston and for our office network in Houston. So you can build pretty interesting patterns, um, especially with these databases online uh, where you just enter an SSID and it shows you where this SSID has been seen. So um, there's actually, there's stores now out there apparently that are using probe requests to identify, um, to identify phones in their stores to see how people are moving around. Because if you put enough sensors around that just read these probe requests, then you know, oh, this person that is constantly asking for this 
network was here on Saturday the last time, spent a lot of time at the milk aisle and is now at the egg aisle, for example. You could do that if you have three sensors, you can triangulate where these things are coming from. So your phones are doing that in this moment. It's a probe response, this is just an access point saying, yep, you asked for me, I'm here. So, now there's common attacks, obviously. Um, the most common one, and this is, I guess, what a lot of people played around with at least, um, is sniffing traffic from open or even encrypted networks. So if you are, um, if you are around an open network, like here I think the Hyatt network, you can go in and you can just sniff the traffic that's going on. So whenever you're on a Wi-Fi, you really, really, really either want to put a VPN over this, one that you trust, obviously, um, or you want to make sure that everything you do um, is, uh, is going through encrypted channels, so HTTPS. You should do that anyways, but just as a reminder, all of this stuff, this is not at all secured in any way if you're connected to an open network. It's really, really, really easy to read. Um, this, um, I remember that a few years ago, someone came out with this Firefox extension, I think, or some, some kind of little tool that would just listen for the network traffic at an open Starbucks Wi-Fi, for example, or any other coffee shop, um, and then just give you Facebook logins. It would just show it to you. And this is, when this came out, oops, when this came out, people really started to enforce HTTPS, they came out with HSTS, all of these things to force people to use encrypted communication on a Wi-Fi simply because it's so unsecure. Now, what many people don't know is that they think, well, I'm in an encrypted network, might be a WPA2 pre-shared key network. Um, the problem is that this can also be sniffed if you are in the network. So if you know the network's password, so you're in your office network, and obviously because you're an employee, you know the, the uh, office network's password, then the connection between you and the access point is encrypted in a way that has been negotiated between you and the access point. So you have your own encrypted channel between these two stations. The problem is that if you sniff the authentication process, you get the whole key so you can, you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can decrypt it again. So if you have the master key, which is the password you enter when you connect to the Wi-Fi, you can read the traffic of every, anyone else who's in the Wi-Fi too. Um, there are certain attempts to block this now. There's all kinds of enterprise encryption stuff, but really most of the things you see out there, I guess, is WPA2 with a pre-shared key. Remember that if anyone else has the master password, very easy. There's a bunch of tools out there that'll do that for you um, to still read the um, still read the communication of everyone else who's in that network. So that doesn't make that that does not give you security at all. So when you're in a Wi-Fi, always, always, always put this through a VPN or make very sure that you have encrypted channels. And there's some things out there that you just forget. For example, Git. If you use Git, um, that is usually unsecured. Um, so if you don't use Git on GitHub through HTTPS, um, that can very, very easily be unencrypted. So there's all kinds of stuff you want to think about, and maybe just tunnel it through a VPN that you trust, which is a whole other talk, I guess. <laughs> um, this attack, so sniffing traffic, pretty much impossible to detect because the way you do it is you just passively sniff the traffic, and then you analyze the captured traffic, and you just decrypt it. So it, it's basically impossible to detect because it's in the air anyways, you just have an antenna that picks it up and then you decrypt it offline. Another common attack is jamming. Um, this is something that some people like to do at conferences for some weird reason I don't understand. But um, you can either do classic jamming, like just put garbage over the frequencies so nothing in the vicinity uh, works on that frequency anymore, but that needs pretty special equipment. I think that also gets certain authorities pretty close to you pretty fast. Um, the thing is, however, you can do that on a higher level of the protocol, which is the authentication frames. Um, there's little Arduino firmwares, for example, or, or uh, Raspberry Pi Zero firmwares um, that will simply listen for all the um, for all the MAC addresses that are connected to a uh, to an access point and we'll just blindly fire the authentication frames around so all these devices constantly disconnect. Um, that works on a, that works on tiny hardware, you just need an antenna. That's pretty much it if it has a Wi-Fi chip and it allows uh, packet injection. Um, this can, however, be detected by simply counting the number of the authentication frames. If you have a histogram of how many the authentication frames are in the air, you should be able to, um, to count that and find anomalies there. I'm going to show that in just a second. Then, this is, I guess, the most interesting one, at least. Um, this is rogue access points. So, what would stop me or anyone 
from just spinning up an access point, calls itself, calls itself Hyatt Wi-Fi, you'll probably join it. If it's the closest to your, uh, to your phone or your device, your phone or your device might actually pick it automatically because they tend to connect to the strongest signal strength. Now I got a man in the middle pretty much because everything goes through my device and I can do DNS poisoning, ARP poisoning, I can listen to all the traffic very easily in fact, I don't even need to mess with all the stuff because it goes through my device anyways. Um, so this is, I think this is the most severe attack that's out there and this is also the most, I would say, uh, 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 popular attack during pen tests and any kind of red teaming. Um, because simply it's so easy to trick devices to connect to something because it can spoof everything, you just give it, you could even give it the same MAC address as the other thing. Who would know that this is a rogue access point and not a normal access point? There are, however, several ways to detect them, luckily. Um, this is what Kismet is extremely good at. Um, you'll be able to do the same thing with Enzyme and with Greylock, um, or you could just use the combination to respond to alerts that Kismet already gives you. Um, it's up to you. So you can detect a rogue access point in several ways. You could, for example, do BSSID whitelisting. This is basically the MAC address of the access point, and you can say, my office has 25 MAC access points. That's 25 MAC addresses. Whenever I see a beacon or probe response or anything that advertises my SSID out there that has a different MAC address, then all alarms should go off because that probably means that someone runs a uh, not very sophisticated attack with simply just another access point that has the same SSID. Problem is you can simply spoof that. You just walk around, uh, record the MAC addresses of the existing access points and just um, just put that MAC address into your access point. Now it's pretty much, now it's really hard to detect it again, right? So this only protects you from very, very unsophisticated attacks. The good thing is there's other ways to detect it. Um, uh, a very interesting thing I thought is by detecting non-synchronized MAC timestamps. A MAC timestamp is a timestamp that is included in every beacon frame of a access point. So remember, this is the access point sending dozens of these every second, saying I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. The other access points will listen to that, and they actually use these to synchronize each other. So because it's extremely important that all of the access points are synchronized up to, I think, I might be wrong, 25 microseconds or something, they have basically their own little version of NTP that goes directly over the, um, directly over the air, and they synchronize each other through a timestamp that they broadcast in these beacons. And the thing is that a lot of people who will be a little more sophisticated and at least spoof a MAC address and run what's called an evil twin attack, they will probably not bother to synchronize these MAC timestamps. So you will have, you can, you could, um, could analyze the MAC timestamp and because it only increases, it's just a, it's just a long that gets, um, that increases and increases and increases, you will have steps in there in every beacon that comes from the wrong access point. So if you collect all of these beacons, and this is something that Enzyme is doing, um, then you can basically draw a chart over the value of the MAC timestamp that's in the air and that should just go linearly go up. If that thing does something funky, that means there's probably someone around here who spoofs an access point without synchronizing the MAC timestamp. You can also detect unusual channel or frequency usage. So if your corporate network always runs on channel 11, suddenly appears on channel 2, uh, might, might be something interesting. The problem is to avoid contention and bandwidth issues. A lot of the um, vendors for the better access points are dynamically choosing the frequencies and channels now. So my home network, for example, is already jumping from channel 1 to 11 because my neighbors are already on channel 11 and when they get very active, then my access point switches to something else. So that doesn't really work anymore. It's also, this is the easiest to spoof probably. You just run your access point on the frequency that the others run on. Now you wouldn't be able to be detected anymore. Um, a crypto drop could be that your network is usually uh, WPA secured and suddenly there's an access point that is not. Um, that could also just very, be a very unsophisticated attacker. That would be something interesting to see. And then something else that I thought was very interesting is by analyzing the signal strength. If you look at, now imagine someone is spoofing the MAC address of an access point. An access point doesn't really move, right? That's mounted to the wall, that's sitting somewhere. If you draw a chart over the mean, um, over the mean signal strength for every MAC address out there, if suddenly there's outliers in there again, if this thing starts to get a little funky, that probably means that someone with the same MAC address sits out there in the, uh, in the parking lot or sits somewhere 
where the access point usually is not at, and you have a completely different signal strength. So this is another way to figure this out. The problem is that there's tools like Kismet, and they're great for detecting this kind of stuff. I really like that project. They also do a lot of Bluetooth stuff now, a lot of fun, open source, should definitely try it out. Um, the problem is that you just get an alert, and it's really hard to respond to that alert, right? I mean, imagine you get an alert, hey, there's a rogue access point. Uh, so what are you going to do now? Shut down, pull the fire alarm? I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do, right? So um, it would be great, I think, or you couldn't, I mean, the answer would be, okay, there was a targeted rogue access point attack. That wasn't just some kid walking around with a pineapple that just sends the odd frames all around. Um, it was a targeted attack. Someone tried to get in here. Um, but I have no idea how to find out who connected to it. I want to find out who of my employees connected to that thing, right? That'd be great. Um, I don't know for how long it was there necessarily, and I don't know where it was located physically. So basically, you just get ne very nervous, but you can't do that much about it. Um, so Wireshark and TCP dump um, can collect all these frames. It's actually pretty easy. You just um, select the interface. You just select the interface um, of your, um, your Wi-Fi adapter and monitor mode. And um, it will just spit out all the um, 802.11 frames. It's very easy. The problem is that they really fall short on long-term collection and analysis. You'll probably run that for an hour, maybe a few minutes. Then you put it in Wireshark. You'll follow the little loading, this, this famous uh, loading indicator on the bottom. It takes forever. Your, your, uh, your computer starts to lock up. They're great, but they are not really there for long-term analysis. You wouldn't want to analyze 500 million frames out there with these tools. So, that's, that's where I stopped with my uh, experience with uh, Wi-Fi security and took a step back and thought about, wait a second, I know about this tool that allows you to collect a lot of structured data and uh, allows you to analyze it. Because if you think about it, really, 802.11 frames, especially the management frames, that's kind of like a NetFlow stuff that comes from your router very high level information about what happened with a lot of meta information about who communicated with whom in what way, right? So I thought, wait, we have something like that. It's called Greylock. I'm kind of familiar with it. So I was on a vacation in Europe. I got bored after a few days. And uh, I started writing something that reads these frames off the air, structures them, and writes them into a Greylock. And that's what I called enzyme. Um, Enzyme, together with Greylock, allows you to store this data for a very, very, very long time. I'm running it in my home lab with uh, two Wi-Fi adapters that are hopping through all channels of the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range. Um, it's been running extremely stable. It runs on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm running one in our office, actually, that's downtown Houston on like 24th floor or something, that gets a lot of frames. Um, that's on one Raspberry Pi uh, 3 Model B, and uh, it's probably a 25 to 30% CPU usage. So it's pretty fast, even though it's written in Java, um, which I'm just very familiar with. But you only run it on the sensor. You don't have to install any client. So um, Java is actually pretty cool. That's going to be another talk. Um, and obviously, I made it open source. Um, I think. There might even be a red team used for it. I would love to hear your ideas. If that is something where you just walk around with that thing, use it kind of like a pineapple, but instead of the pineapple, kind of little clumsy way of analyzing the logs, you have that directly in a tool like Greylock where you can, after that, do a lot of very efficient uh, recon maybe. I don't know. I, I have no clue about a red team. I saw this talk before here. I did not know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> more on the blue team side, definitely. So it's open source, obviously. This is what it looks like. Um, this is three of uh, the stuff you see there in front is the, um, is the network adapters. Then I'm running this there on a different machine. It's like you get them, it's like an Intel Atom chip, I think. They're a little faster. They simply allow you to draw more power from it. Um, raspberries try to start to kind of randomly shut down if you put more than two of these adapters on it. So I wanted to have three, put a different machine on it, but the real one really runs on, uh, on a Raspberry Pi. That's what it looks like. Um, it really only needs one or more Wi-Fi adapters that support monitor mode. It runs on OS X for if you just want to quickly test it. Um, and it, uh, the reference kind of platform is a Raspberry Pi 3 because that's what I run it on. That's where you find it. Um, I have not bought a domain yet. 
because you know what happens when I buy domains. In fact, last night I was about to buy one and I luckily didn't because the karaoke party. Um, <laughs> so, um, find it on GitHub. Maybe if people like it, I might put a domain in front of it. We'll see. Um, this is github.com, my full name slash enzyme. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm going to post a, uh, a link to that. There's actually one or two in there already. Or you go to wtf.horse, um, that has a link to that too. Hope that's easier to remember. Okay. Um, so I would say we just, I, I try to, make the uh, live demo gods happy and just try to show you what this looks like. This is a preloaded page. I don't know if it will reload. Um, oh, before we start, let's actually go to Enzyme here. I wrote, I was late to the party last night because I finished the documentation in the readme. Uh, so this has quite a lot of readme. Um, you should be able to just download it and start it. Um, this should have everything in there. If you get stuck anywhere, please open an issue. Um, you're literally the first people that see this. so. Maybe this doesn't make any sense, or maybe it's just really hard to install. Um, just know already it's Java. Um, so all you need is you need a Raspberry Pi, you need a wireless network interface that supports monitor mode. Uh, I'm linking to those that I'm playing around with. Actually, you get them one for 30, one for 40 bucks off of Amazon. Uh, you probably have some lying around already. This is all abstracted on the operating system layer, so I don't care what you run it with. If it supports monitor mode, we'll be fine. Um, you see here, all it, the other thing that it needs is a Greylock cluster, obviously. Um, this is just one machine running on an old HP server somewhere. Um, you can, if you want to play around with it, if you haven't used it before, if you don't have a Greylock running, there's operating system packages for everything. There's an Amazon image, there's an OVA, if you just want to spin it up quickly on a virtual machine. This shouldn't be the hard part. If you like it, you can still build a real cluster, but um, this shouldn't be the hard part, I think. So, let me show you what the data looks like. Oh my god, it's working. This is amazing. Okay. So, this is also coming through. Oh, it's long. No, I'm going to skip that. It's, it works. That's great. Um, you see here, it's very familiar to, I think the usage of Greylog is very familiar to another log management tool out there that tends to be a little expensive at times. Um, this is, by the way, this is this. If you go to GitHub, download Enzyme, you get all this data. If you go to GitHub, download Greylog, you get this thing. So, it's all open source. Um, you um, basically, you got your search bar up here, you got your messages up here, and you see, and I hope you can read that. Um, for example, you see here that I received a beacon frame for the SSID Xfinity Wi-Fi on this frequency that equals channel 11. It's not WEP. Um, you, it tells you which enzyme sensor um, uh, got it. It gives you signal quality, signal strength. It tells you the SSID, the subtype, very important, and it tells you who send it. So this basically tells me there is an access point with this um, with this MAC address, and it sent a beacon for this SSID. Now Greylock, like any other tool, allows you to, for example, say I want to search in the last two days. Uh, it's still working. Uh, you see here, this is how many frames came in. You see that in the last two days, I collected about five million uh, five million management frames. Result came back in about 376 milliseconds. And now I could go in and say, show me the distribution of the field subtype. Some would call it a pivot, a pivot table. We call it quick values. Click on it. Takes a little because of the story of the connection I'm going to tell you later maybe. But you see that um, we get 75.53% of beacon frames, bunch of probe requests, bunch of probe responses, and some deauth frames. In fact, I think there is a neighbor who has a Raspberry Pi. If I show you this, so let's say I want to see all deauth frames of the last two days. Okay? Click on this button to say add to search query. I could also just type this in here and say subtype equals blah blah blah. But I just click on it to execute the search. I search for it. Now you see this is the distribution of deauth frames somewhere in North Houston over the last two days. You see we got a little spike here. So let's zoom into that. You see that this fills out a query for the uh, time range that I just selected. Execute this thing. And you see that we got about 376 deauth frames here at uh, 6.55 on Friday. And you see here, it tells me this transmitter 
try to deauthenticate this station from this access point. It says unknown reason with a really weird um, code here. That is simply because I wrote the code wrong. This is not an attack. Um, this is an issue already. Um, this would give you a reason like um, the uh, access point is leaving the station or your authentication expired, something like that. I just have to fix that. It's weird network protocols with short and byte order and I got that wrong. Um, so, um, yeah, you see here, so now I might be interested in say this transmitter is deauthenticating authentic, de stuff. So let's take the, uh, let's take the MAC address of the transmitter. I just copied that. Say again, I want to search in the last two days. And I'm just going to run a full text search for this MAC address and say, show me everything that this MAC address did in the last two days. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. So let's see what kind of frames this MAC address sent in the last two days. Okay, it sent a lot of beacons and then about 82 D auth frames. That's interesting. So let's say, show me everything from this MAC address that has the subtype beacon so I can see what kind of network is this device advertising, right? Now we've got all the beacon frames and it is mostly broadcast beacons, which is interesting. So let's go back and see if we find Another device in here. Just one second. This is not what I wanted. Here we go. Live demo, don't disappoint me. Here we go. So let's take, uh, what do we have here? Let's say we want to instead look at the destination. Like what was deauthenticated, right? So I do the same thing go into the last two days, enter this, here we go, this is the activity of this, okay, now that's even more interesting. So again, go into the subtypes, and you see, haha, it sent dauth, it sent a bunch of probe responses, and it sent a bunch of probe requests. So let's see what uh, networks this device asked for. And you'll see it's looking for a network called AT&T Wi-Fi. So you can now, with this kind of stuff, if you detected that there was a rogue access point, you could go in and say, show me all the authentication frames that went to this device and run a pivot table over the transmitters of that, which is the devices that try to connect. Do that, and then you'll get a list of all the MAC addresses that are connected to this very specific um, access point that might be a rogue access point. You can use the um, uh, you can use the uh, generate chart feature here to build this linear chart of the MAC timestamp, for example. You could use that to build the average signal quality of all of your uh, access points that are out there. I am also using uh, the lookup tables that are in Greylock that can be filled from any kind of API to, for example, get me a transmitter name where I basically translate um, uh, MAC addresses to known devices. So you see that this is my uh, main access point at home. This is my extender at home. Uh, there, I don't know who Jane is, to be honest, but Jane's MacBook apparently sent a bunch of stuff. Um, it's my Amazon Echo in the office. There's a Chromecast in the bathroom. So to make it easier to analyze all of this stuff, you can use the lookup tables to translate MAC addresses to uh, names, for example. Uh, now, my favorite thing before we go, because we only got a few minutes left, I promised you more Q&A time, I'm sorry. My favorite thing is to go in and say, show me all the probe requests, which is in the last two days, that was about 296,000. Show me all the probe requests. And then give me the SSIDs that the devices asked for. There you go. This is my Sonos at home. This is going crazy a little. I don't know why, but you'll see there's a bunch of people asking for, uh, this is AT&T networks. This, in fact, this is our network in Hamburg. That is about eight and a half thousand kilometers away, but my phone asks for it. So this appears somewhere in North Houston now. Um, you see everything here. The neighbor's car will appear in there. You can, with this stuff, if you wanted to, I'm very specifically not doing that, but if you wanted to, you could build patterns 
of when the neighbor goes to his car, if it's his wife or him, when the car leaves and when they come back, simply because the stupid Camaro is sending beacon frames that you can follow. You can even see how fast they drive away based on the signal strength. It's like, <laughs> so, this Wi-Fi stuff is crazy. It's a lot of fun to just send it in and just dig through it. Um, so, yeah, I open sourced this. I hope it's any value for anyone. And uh, if you have any questions, you can you can fire out uh, GitHub issues. You can connect me, follow me on Twitter. I'm around for the whole day until tomorrow night, actually. So if you run into me, I'm happy to talk about it. And I hope this was uh, this was interesting. First time I did it. So thank you very much. I think we've got five minutes left for questions. So if there's any questions out there? Yeah. 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 So the question was, is there any way to configure these channel hopping uh, frequencies, for example? Yes, you can do that. Uh, here's an example config. In fact, you see here that it has a channel hop interval. That's simply, it's currently in seconds. I might expect that some people want to have that in uh, milliseconds, for example. I can change that. Um, it also has a beacon frame sampling rate. So if you say, I only want to record every fifth, every 20th beacon, simply because it's so much data, then you can do that too. Um, that's an interesting idea. That's currently, no, currently doesn't do that. If you could open an issue for that, that'd be great. That'd be interesting. Uh, if you, if basically, if, if you can send data back to Enzyme to look at something very specifically. Because right now you do, uh, you do channel hopping. Um, I mean, basically you need, you all saw the, the famous Wi-Fi cactus, I think, with this guy with like hundreds of access points, hundreds of Wi-Fi cards on his back. This is because if you do channel hopping, because the Wi-Fi card always has to be tuned to one frequency. If you want to get all frequencies, you have to hop over these frequencies. If you want to narrow into a certain frequency and a certain device, for example, I think that was your question, right? Oh, okay. Even better. Yeah. Okay, sorry, then I misunderstood your question. The question then was, um, can Enzyme, when I detect a, um, a rogue access point, and this, you, this means you understand the, the whole topic, <laughs> um, can Enzyme then fire the auth uh, frames at the devices that are currently connected to it, right, to force them off the uh, rogue access point? It currently can't do that, but that would be interesting. Greylock has REST APIs, so you could have a Python script or something that just reads that from Greylock and then fires it off. That might be interesting. It's a very good question. Yeah. It, it currently only supports Greylock, but it sends a GALF message, which is a Greylock uh, message. Logstash, for example, supports that as an input. So if you want to write it somewhere else, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. By the way, if anyone finds a shop where you can get a Yagi antenna with a real, uh, I forgot the name already, SPSMA something thing that works with a, with a normal adapter, let me know. I still don't have one. For three months and a lot of different adapters,